All right. This is uh, Joe from the Jody White Talks radio program. That was Stevie Nicks from uh, the famous band Fleetwood Mac. Um, I love Fleetwood Mac, so that was just one of the first songs that I thought of uh, to put on the show. Um, she was on the first, uh, not the first season, what am I talking about? Third season of American Horror Story. Um, but uh, I want to announce what we're going to do tonight. Uh, I have a, my guest who's uh, on the line. Her name is Ashley Neal. Ashley, are you, on the, are you on the phone right now? Yeah, hey, how are you? Not bad, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing great. Great, I'm so excited that you're on the show tonight. Um, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> um, and uh, I've, uh, I saw so many pictures on your Facebook page, so it's kind of like Facebook stalking you. But um, <laughs> uh, That's okay, that's what they're there for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was so jealous because you got to go to this uh, Comic Con event. Where was that? San Diego or where was it? Um, I've never been to uh, the San Diego Comic Con, but I've been to a lot of other um, smaller Comic Cons, which they're actually getting bigger each year. Right. Um, I currently live in St. Louis, and so I kind of go mm -hmm. to I go to quite a few in Chicago every year. Um, okay. I've been to one in New Orleans. I've been to one in Salt Lake City. Um, I'm actually flying to um, Philadelphia next weekend for a Comic Con. So the uh, the last one that I went to though was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, the next time you're going to a Comic Con, I want you to stow me away, like put me in the you know the back trunk. I will. I'll t I can uh, put you in my in my travel bag. I think you'll fit. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I'll be like a little Mogwai, <laughs> except you know I I can deal with water. You can feed me after midnight, and I won't you know turn into a green monster. So that'll be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you met Chris Evans um, from Captain America and Bucky. I want you to tell yes. me what those experiences were. Um, amazing. In one word. Uh, so uh, two years ago, I went to a Comic-Con in Chicago. Uh, it was Wizard World Chicago 2014. Mm -hmm. And... Sebastian Stan, who plays the Winter Soldier, and Anthony Mackie, who plays Falcon in the Captain America movies, were both there. And um, seeing both of them was amazing. They are both hilarious. They're hysterical. Um, me and my friends, we sat through their Q&A panel, and then we mm -hmm. both uh, got their autographs and pictures with them. Um, I actually saw... Sebastian Stan is like one of my favorite actors, and I'm a really big fan girl of his. Um, I've seen a lot of his stuff, and I actually kind of and I stalked him that weekend because <laughs> it was like the, the first night that I was there, my friend had an autograph and she let me go through the line with her. And so um, I guess like it was kind of towards the end of the night. So they were letting him, you know, talk a little more with fans and take pictures and stuff. And so right. me and him, we took a selfie together and it was great. Oh. And then the next day I got, I had my own autograph ticket. So I went through the line, got my own poster autograph and, uh, I was a nerd and told him that I'd been a fan of his since The Covenant, which was like a horrible, awful um, teenage witchy movie from like 2003 or something. Mm -hmm. um, but he laughed and said it, that was awesome, so that he was a good sport. <laughs> uh, and then after that, I had um, two photo ops with him, which are like professional um, photos. So I had seen him four separate times, and this was back in 2014. And last year, in September, I flew to Salt Lake City, which was my first time at Salt Lake, and it was beautiful. And um, I had I flew there specifically to see Chris Evans, and Sebastian Stan being there was kind of like just a bonus. And so I had, had an autograph with, uh, for both of them and photo ops with both of them. And so I, the very first time I saw Sebastian last year was for his photo op, and I walked up to him and... I'm I'm just a huge nerd and I act like I've known these people forever and like right. I walked up to him and like act like we were friends. I was like, Sebastian, <laughs> how are you? And he looked at me and he goes, Do I know We've you? met before? <laughs> and I remember you. And I was like, Are you like I stopped dead? I was like, Are you serious? And I took, you know, celebrities, especially Marvel actors, meet thousands of people like within a month's time, you know. Right. And like he just like looked at me and was like, I remember you. And I, we met before and I was like, Yeah, we met Chicago last year and he like kinda of smiled and we took the picture and I moved along because I don't know if you've ever been to a Comic Con before, but like the pictures are like very, very quick because there's like so many people in line. But exactly. Um so just basically, the fact that he remembered me mm -hmm. from last year or a year prior was mm -hmm. just like 
mind blowing, and I like screamed internally. And then after I got out of the photo op room, I screamed out loud. And then I had to call my best friend, and then I was like, "It was it was great." Um, and then shortly after that, uh, I had a um, a photo op with Sebastian and with Chris. Mm-hmm. So it was Captain America and the Winter Soldier, and I was so excited. Oh. Oh. It was like the, fir- the very first time I was meeting Chris Evans, which Chris Evans is. A couple of years ago, he slowly started to become a like you know a a list you know Hollywood name you know, right. and um, so I always kind of thought that he was definitely too popular to ever even come to a convention. Right. And Salt Lake City was actually the first convention outside of the big San Diego Comic Cons that he had ever done. So. I was so excited to, you know, be there and get to meet him and get to talk to him. And uh, so the very first time I met him was for a photo. And so I, you know, I walked up and they both smiled at me and they put their arms around me and I was like grasping their waist and we all smiled like big nerds and it was great. It was awesome. (laughs) Um, And then shortly after that, uh, I got in line for his autograph and um, a friend of mine, my friend lives out in California and she's you know, into, like, the exact same stuff that I am. We had met mm-hmm. up at this convention, and uh, she had bought Chris um, jelly bean, uh, Starburst jelly beans, because apparently he said, like, in one of his interviews, and those are, like, his favorite candies. So she, like, stopped at the gas station and got him some as a gift. And I was like, I was like, that's a good idea, and I'm so pumped. I'm oh, going to no buy him way. something okay. too, because, you know, celebrities love when strangers give them gifts, you know? Like, that's not creepy uh-huh. at all. But uh, <laughs> well, um, I saw a video of Justin Bieber, you know, throwing out a gift out of the limo. But that's Justin Bieber. He, oh, I don't no, think he's even no, a human. And you can't even compare Chris Evans to Justin Bieber. Like those are not even. That's like two, you just can't. But anyway, but that's like comparing but, Brussels sprouts uh, so to. I actually stopped at. Um, yeah. I actually stopped at a store and I bought a little mini bag of Doritos because it's like kind of like a not so inside joke anymore that. <gasps> Um, a couple of years ago, Robert Downey Jr., who plays Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man, um, in an interview, he had said that Chris Evans has the body type of a Dorito because his upper body is so big and his waist is so small that it's very triangular. So there have been, you know, a couple of interviews where people have referenced Chris Evans as a Dorito. So I bought him a little bag of Cool Ranch Doritos <laughs> and I gave it to him. And he was like, he was oh like can I tweet you for more Doritos? And I was like, absolutely. Yeah. And he never did, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so awesome. <laughs> I know. It was, it was so cool. And like, there were so many people from so many different places that came specifically just for Chris Evans. And it was like, it was just a great experience. Like, I love being around total strangers that I have at least one thing in common with because you can just, you know, you can go on that one topic and talk about it forever. Like, you can, okay. like, and just standing in lines for autographs and photo ops at these different condo cons. Like, I meet so many different people. You know, we just start talking like we've known each other for years. It's always so awesome. But I feel like the, the positive energy is supplied by all these actors that have equal positive energy because, you know, majority of them, they all want to be there. They're all so excited to meet people that admire right. them and are fans mm-hmm. of their work. So it's, I love comic Con. They're great. So uh, how long was the line? Um, like in minutes? Um, is it? Like- uh, oh, forever. Um, <laughs> I, I know. Uh, the, well, I'll say the, the actual convention was three days long. And if I remember correctly, Chris was there on Friday and Saturday. Right. Or maybe the convention okay. was only two days long. I don't remember. I've, okay. I have a horrible memory. But I remember specifically just being in a line Friday night, like, almost the entire time. <laughs> because I just went from line to line to line. But Salt Lake City, I believe it was their um, third year doing the convention. So they were, you know, they weren't exactly new to the whole scene, but this was, like, the biggest actor that they ever had. So, you know, it was organized very well. Of course, there were, you know, okay. little lapses in judgment or, you know, little mess-ups every now and then, but that's kind of to be expected. But I, I'm fairly certain for um, when I had my solo photo op with Chris Evans, I'm pretty sure I was in the line for at least an hour, if not a little longer. But okay. it was worth it. Every so- second was worth it <laughs> so basically the lines are like at six flags you you're waiting there for two hours for the thunder river ride and you're only there for about 20 seconds 
Exa- exactly. I think going to Six Flags as a child just kind of built me up for this uh, this line adventure that you at Comic Con. So it's no no big thing. Exactly. No big it's thing. a <laughs> Comic Con basic training. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I want to talk to you about some trending hashtags. Um, the first trending hashtag is give Steve a boyfriend. Hashtag absolutely all caps. Hashtag <laughs> yes. Y A S. Yes. Um, I was, I actually was reading up a little bit on it um, when the hashtag started trending a couple days ago. And I guess it kind of spawned from Adina Menzel, who plays Elsa in Frozen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess some of her fans were saying, you know, how in Frozen, Anna ends up with her little boyfriend, and Elsa doesn't really end up with anybody. And they're kind of like, Elsa should have a girlfriend. Let's, you know, let's get some more, you know, gay, lesbian, um, you know, stuff going on in comics. And it, like, started trending. And, like, apparently Adina Menzel, like, tweeted it and, like, was all for it and, which I think is awesome. And so uh, apparently this whole give Steve Rogers, give Captain America a boyfriend kind of spawned from it, which I totally support because if you've seen at least one Captain America movie, you can tell that Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes are in love with each other. Period. Okay? Just, <laughs> just period. Oh, I wouldn't... <laughs> Whether you interpret that as a platonic friendship love or romantic love, it's totally up to you, but those two love each other. I would... Um, uh, with me, I'm, uh, I come from the military, so, um, I would, from my interpretation, it came from the army values. You don't leave a soldier behind and, uh, you, uh, always stick with that person thick and thin. That just, those, that was my interpretation of their relationship. It was army based. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the second movie, Winter Soldier, like, I mean, a couple of times it said, you know, I'm, w- I'm with you to the end of the line. And, mm-hmm. you know, even, especially in Civil War, which, you know, is the third Captain America that just came out, like, poor Bucky Barnes has been, spoiler alert if you haven't seen anything, but, you know, he's been brainwashed by Hydra and he's killed all these people and he's done horrible mm-hmm. things. But, right. you know, for Steve, like, that's his brother. Like, when he was a child, like, all he had was Bucky and he's, you know, with him to the end of the line, no matter what he's done. But I really, I really like the way that Marvel portrays their relationship because it, it you know, it shows that people can do horrible things, but you know, if they're genuinely sorry for it, other people, your true friends, are going to stick with you and love you no matter what. Right, right. And you know what I mean. And like, I, I love the relationship between Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes. And me just being a crazy fangirl, I'm like, they're in love. But that's just me. <laughs> right. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um i yeah i i really i really like the relationship they have in the movies just because i mean captain america 3 is basically you know civil war is protecting bucky barnes like protect bucky barnes at all costs i'm, I'm with you steve rogers for sure yeah um it, it was also uh you know protect bucky barnes and also uh, i thought it was kind of like um what is the agenda? What what do people uh, want to uh, go for? Is this uh, a government intervention? Because uh, I'm going to uh, also do some spoilers. Um, something happened in Nigeria. An accident happened. Uh, and people are blaming the Avengers. And the Avengers have to sign this treaty. Um, and Iron Man from a very, very unusual circumstance supports the treaty. Uh, Captain America does not. And um, they basically fight it out um, based on, you know, the treaty and also personal uh, personal feelings with Bucky Barnes. And I, uh, I'm not going to try to spoil it further, but something happens really bad at the end uh, to where Iron Man basically hates uh, Bucky's, Bucky's guts. <laughs> Okay, at the end of the movie, like like you said, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but like the end of the movie, that little kind of twist that they threw in, like I loved it. Like it was, I don't want to say it was realistic because obviously it's a comic book and it's a fictional story, but you know, it's not like, oh, aliens came in and bad things happened. It was like, you mm-hmm. know, somebody did this form of betrayal to Tony Stark and he's mad about it. You know, he's angry about it. And I kind of love that 
Tony Stark was actually for the treaty, because you would kind of think that he would be, you know, anti, anti-government anti control and yada, 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 but I think people tend to forget that Tony Stark has a lot of guilt on his conscience. Like, in the, you know, in the first, it shows in the first movie that, you know, he finds out that all of his Stark industry bombs are, you know, being made to kill people, and he, you know, sees that, you know, when he gets captured in that cave, and I, like, I... I love that through the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they kind of keep that relevant, Tony's guilt, because I I feel like his guilt over his weapons being used for bad, like, fuel a lot of his actions, especially in Civil War. Right. Um, there's an interpretation going around uh, on the blogs, the blogosphere, saying that Iron Man is the villain of this film, instead of... Um, who was that um, evil, uh, evil guy in behind the scenes um, who uh, uh, tried to, uh, you know, accelerate um, the disputes between uh, Captain America and Iron Man? Oh, the yeah, uh, what that little creepy guy who uh, who wanted who like kidnapped Bucky and was trying to like make him tell him about uh, the mission report. Is that guy? Yeah, um, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember his name, of course, at all. Unless you have, like, an easy name, like Captain America or Iron Man, like, I'm going to forget it, but that's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, what they did in Civil War, though, was they used, you know, they used that character, like, as a, like, a middleman, like a pivotal point, and I kind of love that, you know, towards the end, before that big climactic, you know, fight scene between Iron Man and Captain America, you know, he said, he was like, I can never defeat you myself, so I'm going to have somebody else defeat you. And, you know, that kind of showed the motive behind him trying to exacerbate this fuel between Captain America and Iron Man. And, like, I really like the logic behind that. Like, I don't like that Captain America and Iron Man are fighting, obviously. But, right, right. Uh, but I really like the thought process behind, like, this normal guy who has this agenda. You know, he knows he can't beat Captain America, he knows he can't beat Iron Man, but he knows they could probably beat each other. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, makes all this bad stuff come to light so that they turn on each other. And it's kind of like, it kind of reminded me um, how some people will say, you know, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer so you can, you know, kind of infiltrate yourself in the situation and kind of know everything. Like, he, like, I I just feel like he was kind of like a double agent, even though he wasn't really an agent of anything, but you know, because you think that he's, his agenda is one thing, but he totally has his personal agenda where he's just pitting everyone against each other for his own personal gain. Right. Um, I just found out his name is Baron Zemo. Ah, yes. <laughs> he, he's, he hides so much in the shadows, we don't even know his own name. <laughs> I, 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 he was a great character, too. Like, I, yeah, he was. I need him to have a, a really easy name that I can remember. Something easy, like Sam. I got a bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bad memory, too. That's why I have to. <laughs> um, okay, um, so uh, that the, the reason why I, I asked you that was because um, there was an article... Um, posted on one of the blogs saying that Iron Man at the end of the film where they were having their last confrontation, Iron Man kind of looked like Ultron in a way. Which is Ooh, like, well, I mean, which kind of makes sense because Tony Stark made Ultron. Right. Or not in the comic books. Hank Pym made Ultron in the comic books, but you know, in the movie. Film. It was Tony Stark. It was kind of like his, his pet, pet baby project. Right, exactly. His little pet project. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, and also I feel like in Age of Ultron, you know, Avengers Two, I feel like Tony's guilt from just all the stuff that he has on his conscience was exactly why he even made Ultron. You know, he wanted to make a robot that would protect everybody and protect the people that he loves and. You know, of course, like in any good sci-fi movie, the robot goes rogue and wants to kill right. everybody. No big exactly. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, yeah, I, at the end of Civil War, I feel like, well, I mean, even through, I mean, completely throughout Civil War, depending on, you know, what side you're on, you could definitely see Tony Stark kind of like as the villain. It's kind of like, 
one of those unconventional villains, you know, like, he's not necessarily a bad guy, but, you know, what he's doing, you don't really stand for it, you know, that's obviously from a Team Cap point of view, but, and I mean, wherever they decide to take the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like, you know, I, I just feel like Tony Stark has the power and he has the the money and the will and mm-hmm. the know-how to, you know, do anything he wants, basically. So he could totally be kind of like in that unconventional villain role, which I think would be really interesting, but I kind of hope it doesn't happen because I do love Tony Stark. I just want everyone to get along. Exactly. Um, I was, <laughs> uh, um, in um, a previous interview about Captain America, because I did my whole little review about it, I felt that this movie was too dark. Um, I was used to the Josh Whedon kind of um, directing to where he interjects humor to almost every, almost everything. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, like Buffy, um, she kicks butt um, on on the you know small TV screen, but she does it with jokes and humor, and that's what I love. And once I came into this film expecting that kind of uh, atmosphere, um, of course, this was directed by the Russo brothers. Um, it was totally different, uh, totally, uh, like the first, like half an hour of the first act, it was so dark and so depressing that I'm like, please give me some humor cause I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. It, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I do agree. I personally, I've always been kind of more of a, when it, in terms of movies, I've always been more of a Marvel fan than a DC fan because, and I like DC, don't get me wrong, but I feel that Marvel is a lot more lighter and it's a lot more, you know, it's, it's action and it's comedy and it's a little bit of drama and it's, it's fun. And DC is just like, you know, here's Christian Bale and he's the Dark Knight and he's so depressed and everything bad happens in his life and, you know, which I feel like a lot of the DC movies have right. like this very, <laughs> this very dark, very serious, no joke atmosphere right. and I you know and I can kind of I definitely see where you're coming from where like the Civil War definitely had more of like a serious tone to it and I, I feel like it, I feel like when Winter Soldier came out Captain America Winter Soldier which was number two I feel like when that came out that was like it felt so different from all the other MCU movies because it was, you know, it was still a comic book movie, but it was like, you know, there were there was war, there were guns, and there were, you know, it was, had a very realistic element to it. Right. You know, and all the other movies were very, you know, comic book genre. Like, you've got Thor and his hammer, and he flies with a cape, and Iron Man in his suit that flies, you know, like, but, you know, Captain America, of course, he does have his superpowers, but it's... You know, a guy running around punching people, and, you know, his mm-hmm. enemies have weapons that are very real, and I feel like Civil War kind of just took that to the next level, and so it's, it's definitely, I feel like Civil War would be a good movie for people who aren't really sure they like comic book superhero movies, because <laughs> right. it's kind of like half a comic book superhero movie, kind of like a, you know, just a regular action movie, which I think is awesome, but yeah, definitely depending on what type of movie you like, I definitely see, you know, how you would kind of be like, man, this is, this is too, this is too real. (laughs) Right. Um, And then Spider-Man showed up and I was like, yes, this is the humor that I was wanting all along because he was just such a innocent kid. I was pleasantly surprised Mm -hmm. by Peter Parker popping up. Like, I mean, I obviously knew that it was going to happen, but I feel like, you know, just from the start of Civil War, it just jumped right into it. You know, there was no intro. It jumped right in, and mm-hmm. so much action was happening. So finally, when Peter Parker did pop up his head, I was like, oh, yeah, that's a thing. And then, like, I love how they're portraying him as just this normal, like, 16-year-old boy who's mm-hmm. goofy, and he says awesome all the time, and he says dude all the time. And, you know, like I and I enjoyed the previous Spider-Man movies, but, I, but you know, I always feel like Tobey Maguire, you know, he was, he was an adult. And then mm-hmm. Andrew Garfield, he was kind of like this suave, kind of cool, kind of good-looking, you know, guy. And then this new Peter Parker comes in, and he's just, he's a total child, and I love it. Like, it's, I feel like it's a, 
it's a little bit of a different take on this character that we've already seen, you know, so many movies for. And I actually read something online that uh, Robert Downey Jr. Um, signed up to do the new um, Spider-Man movie. I don't know if it's going to be a big role or a small mm-hmm. role or what, but I really liked the chemistry between Peter Parker and Tony Stark. Like I, It was totally like that dad and son or like, your quirky, weird uncle and, you know, nephew, like that kind of relationship, like right off the bat. I thought, exactly. I thought they played each other really well. I loved them together. Yeah, it was, he was like a father to Peter Parker because, you know. Right. It, yeah. Um, and I thought it was really nice for him to give a whole entire stipend to MIT. I, I thought that was just completely unexpected. Right, right. I like that. Tony Stark, once he, you know, kind of saw the error in his ways of his big, bad weapon bomb company, he uses his resources to help people, and he uses his resources to help people help themselves. You know, like in Iron Man 3, um, the little boy, Ty Simpkins is his real name, I don't know what his character name was, of course, but like, you know, like, Tony Stark, you know, bumped into him, and it was totally not expected, but, like, at the end of the movie, he, you know, you know, he gives them these resources to help this little kid better himself, you know, through his education and through his curiosity. And, you know, I like that Tony Stark uses his wealth for good, and I mm-hmm. think that's definitely, like, what they're setting him up to do with Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. Um, and, again, I, I just uh, adored uh, Peter Parker's innocence. In this movie, yeah, uh, because you know when you see uh, Bucky trying to hit Spider-Man and Spider-Man catches the, his metal arm, dude, you got a metal arm? That's awesome! I and was I'm like, crying I with laughter. My like, lid. That whole entire fight scene, like I felt like, was wonderful just because it was so funny. You know, like all the all the banter and all the like at the like with um. Winter Soldier and Falcon, like, when Spider-Man, like, shoots their hands down and uh, Falcon, like, brings out his little his little pet robot thing and he kind of, like, knocks Spider-Man out of the air and Bucky's like, you couldn't have done that earlier? And he's like, I hate you. Like, I was just crying with laughter. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing. yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I really, I think, that, I think that's actually why I like the fact that Peter Parker is so young in this go-around is because he does have that, that childlike innocence. You know, right. it's so typical for like a superhero to be so jaded and so you know i hate the world and so dark and mysterious but then like here's peter parker who like he was a kid and he got bit by a spider (laughs) like you know so i I, yeah i really do like that that childlike persona that he has playfulness Mm -hmm. um so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a midway break steve is gonna have a rapper enjoy eventually so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play Kenny Kane and her son Rap Around Joy. Take it away.
And that was Candy Cane with Wraparound Joy. Um, she was featured on uh, a Showtime TV show called The L Word. And uh, she is a uh, independent blues singer, and she promotes uh, LGBTQ equality. So, Ashley, you're still on the line? Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay. And I want to talk more about Captain America because I just... Um, I, I I sent you this article yesterday. I think it was yesterday in reference yes. to uh, Captain America, the issue number one from him uh, turning Hydra or I think he was a Hydra secret agent all along, which is kind yes. of weird. Um, it's not kind of weird. It's totally weird. It's very weird because it just changes his whole entire origin story altogether. It does. I actually uh, was reading up a little bit on it today, and there was an article that I found that said, um, you know, in the in the original Captain America comic books, you know, it uh, took place in World War II, and um, Hydra, you know, was had its base in Nazi Germany, and you know, it was a one of the like most popular Captain America comic books has a picture of Captain America punching Hitler in the face, and. You know, it was very patriotic and very, mm-hmm. you know, like the parallels were very easily drawn between like Marvel good and evil and kind of like the real good and evil, like of World right. War II, you know. And um, I read this article that kind of said, you know, it's kind of a, a slap in the face to the original writers because, mm-hmm. you know, Hydra was obviously a, you know, example of kind of like what the Nazis did during World War II and, exactly. you know, to have Captain America, which stands for, you know, patriotism and Justice everything that's just and, and right in the America. American way. To and have, like, have him be working for them the entire time. Like, it's kind of just like a slap in the face to the original writers of the comic books, which I kind of agree with. Um, but I also read another article <laughs> that said that, you know, comic books, even nowadays, it's a business and people want fans to read their comic books and buy their comic books and be talking about them mm-hmm. and this was definitely a plot twist that has people talking you know like they say like no publicity is bad publicity um i would think uh, that at the end uh, this hydra theory or hydra plot twist is um just i would think uh that he is like coming from like an alternate universe Borrowing from the Flash, or let's say he's a clone. They cloned, managed to clone Steve Rogers. Right. Um, I actually read in, in an article. Read all these articles. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, I believe it was, it was an interview with the artist who draws the comic books. They're the current series that they're starting, and the writer. And the writer said that he can, you know, definitely tell people that it's not. A clone. It's not him being brainwashed by anybody. It's the real Steve Rogers. But if I recall, I don't think he ruled out alternative universe, Mm -hmm. which I feel like in comic books is like 50% of all the stories that are out there is always an alternate alternate universe. (laughs) So I, I definitely don't think this is you know, plain and simple, oh, Steve Rogers was working for Hydra the whole time, no big deal. Like, I definitely think there's something else going on. Like, there's some other kind of agenda, you know, or, I mean, back in, like, I think it was 2008, like, Steve Rogers died in the comic books, and Bucky took over as Captain America, and then I think he came back or something, or, you know, there's so many things that go on in the comic book world that if it happened in real life, like, you know, like, once you die in real life, you don't come back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, even I, though we wish that were possible. But, yeah, you wish that so were I possible. I feel like nothing's final in comic books. Yeah, um, well, we got a TV show now uh, where you have a lady that's actually using glamour magic to make herself look young, and she brings back Jon Snow from the dead. Um, oh. But that's just, a, you know, a, a fantasy magical universe uh, that's in the mind of George R. R. Martin. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I all the different TV shows and movies that I watch, and all the different you know fandoms that I'm in. I feel like the general rule is just because you're dead doesn't mean you stay dead. <laughs> so I feel mm-hmm. like, and I mean that's 
the ultimate plot line. You know, death is the ultimate plot line in any type of media. And so if that can be reversed, I think, like, any of this other stuff can be reversed. So I'm holding on to holding on to that hope that, you know, in a couple months we'll be like, oh, it was all a joke, just kidding. Exactly. <laughs> Rogers isn't really working for Hydra, just kidding. Or it could have been a dream, just kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been just a nightmare. I, 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 who knows? There's, I mean, there's so many different theories that I'm sure are already floating around the internet, even though it's been like 24, 48 hours since, you know, the bomb was dropped that Steve Rogers has been working for Hydra. But, like, fans come up with, like, so many intricate theories that, like, make sense. And I think it's awesome. I think it, you know, fuels people's creative juices, and I think it's great. But, I mean, when you get down to it, like, people that write comic books, comic book writers are just people like you and me. You know, they just happen to have more money than some of us do. But, <laughs> but you know, so they come up with, you know, ideas just like you and me could. So I definitely am hoping for a light at the end of the Hydra tunnel. I am definitely hoping for a light uh, at the end of the tunnel or uh, some, some old lady uh, yelling, Carol Ann, Carol Ann. And I'm like, uh, like in the I'm touching a TV screen. <laughs> 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 Go to the light, Carol Ann. Oh, okay, um, I, I'm the master at uh, dry jokes. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> I um, was also I uh, picked up uh, and I got this with me. Um, I don't know if you follow DC Comics very often. Um, a little bit. I am talking more of the movies and what's going on in the comic book world, although, you know, I, I dabble in reading about the DC comics, so. Okay, um, so DC just released their latest um, DC Rebirth issue yesterday. Like, I just drove over, uh, like, raced over to the comic book store just to get it. Um, I have heard about, I have heard about Rebirth, it's um, Wonder Woman looks amazing, in my opinion. Um, the, but there is um, uh, an origin story that they revealed, like a, a little clue they revealed about the Joker. Um, so basically, Batman goes into a computer, like a big supercomputer, and he uploads all the knowledge uh, about um, the villains uh, just to get you know a, a speed ahead against you know the Joker and Lex Luthor. Um, and uh, dark side, etc. So he comes to find out that the Joker is not one, it's not two Jokers, but he has to fight against three Jokers. There are three different Jokers. That's not okay. That's not okay. <laughs> in, in terms of Batman. <laughs> yeah. I actually did hear about that. Uh, that little plot twist they threw in there. I think that's awesome. I think it's very cool. He's got a lot of work ahead of him. Oh, yeah. I think that, and I mean, you know, like I said, I I dabble in, you know, in DC films, but I feel like the Joker just has such presence, and even, you know, back in the day when Jack Nicholson played the Joker, like, that was such an iconic performance, you know, like, like, people my age show their kids the old Batman movies, you know, and so it's kind of like it goes through the generations and, I mean, then when Heath Ledger did his Joker in mm -hmm. The Dark Knight, like, that right. was just a whole different monster, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak, which was also a another wonderful performance. Exactly. So I really like that DC is still keeping the Joker relevant, which mm -hmm. I, you know, I think is smart on their part, because they know that, you know, Joker fans are definitely still out there. Um, I'm really interested about the Suicide Squad movie. I'm really excited about that one because from what I heard, Batman is supposed to make a, a, a cameo into that one. Um, Are you serious? That's awesome. Yes, uh, he's supposed to make a cameo. Um, uh, and the t uh, he's not uh, meeting the Joker directly. He meets Harley Quinn. Um, do you remember uh, the uh, in the trailer that that there's like this big purple car that uh, it's almost like a Ferrari that uh, the Joker's driving and yeah. um, 
Harley Quinn is uh, uh, saying, "You, I hope you have insurance." Um, yes, yes. And Batman's on top of the vehicle, and uh, the vehicle uh, goes into a river, and he saves Harley Quinn from the river. I that I really I really love that they're finally bringing Harley Quinn into like the DC movies because I remember you know being a kid and watching all the different. Batman cartoons on, right. you know, Channel 11, on WB11, and stuff like that, and, uh, and, as, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Harley Quinn get her premiere, her debut characterization in a cartoon? Yes. Um, and then she got written into the comic book? Right. So, basically, um, as a backstory for the listeners who aren't familiar with Harley Quinn, um, Harley Quinn was a uh, medical doctor. She was a psychiatrist. Um, and her actual name was Harleen Quizel. So um, she made her premiere in the Batman, the animated series. And um, and she was written in as the psychic for the Joker. Um, and Harley Quinn, uh, or Harleen Quinzel, before she became Harley Quinn, um, interviewed the Joker. And as time progressed, as her interviews went on, uh, because she was trying to treat the guy, um, the Joker had the upper hand. And the Joker basically mind controlled her and gave her a good, you know, mind. Uh, how can I say this without doing the F word on the radio? Um, mind <laughs> messing. He, he messed with her mind big time. And um, she basically um, broke down. She went to a, a costume shop and she stole everything in the costume shop. That she needed to, and she dressed dressed up as like a um, a jester, and um, she just started appearing, making uh, assisting the Joker with all his crimes and stuff. And I think she kind of like helped him break out. Um, in the New Fifty Two version, uh, when uh, Harleen Quinn was transferred over to the comic book arena, um, she has a different origin story, which is kind of interesting because. Um, you wouldn't think they they would change that. I would think that they would keep the same origin story. But she uh, basically, uh, like the Joker, falls into a vat of chemicals. And she becomes insane. Um, and uh, everything falls into place. And uh, it just... And I love Margot Robbie. And I, I've seen like bits and pieces of her in this role. And I'm, I'm just... I just can't wait... She looks legit insane, and it's great. Yes, <laughs> I am. I am a little sad that they're not bringing in the the gesture outfit, but that's okay. I'll forgive them. Um, yeah, that's based but, on the new Fifty Two, yeah, the I'm, costume I'm so as well. Excited, so, though, like, and I'm really curious as to like where they're gonna go with the Joker and Harley Quinn, just because I feel like um, a majority of the online fan base, you know, a lot of people kind of recognize the Joker and Harley Quinn's relationship for what it is, which is kind of an abusive relationship. Like, he's, you know, he's not nice to her. He, mm. he manipulates her, he controls her, and she, you know, follows him around like a puppy. And I, not that I like when anybody is in that situation, but right. I kind of really like that that's what they did with those characters because mm -hmm. I like every type of situation to be, you know, represented in any type of media. And so I kind of like that a lot of people recognize it as an abusive relationship because that's absolutely what it is, and that's, you know, something that people should be talking about. And I kind of hope that they're not going to, you know, romanticize it for, for Hollywood, which they mm -hmm. totally could, and, you know, if they did, it would be okay. But I kind of hope that they show, you know, the Joker just being totally nuts and not a great boyfriend to Harley Quinn, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for Suicide Squad. I'm really curious as what they're going to do with those two characters particularly. And then, I mean, there's so many other characters that are in the movie and I'm just kind of like focusing on those two and I'm like, no, there's other characters. Pay attention. Um, I'm interested in how Will Smith is going to, uh, portray Deadshot. Because normally it's like uh, Will Smith, uh, he's done some pretty bad films, uh, <laughs> especially with his son after Earth. That was terrible. Um, I did not see that movie because of 
the bad back <laughs> <laughs> um, thank God I was able to stream it from Encore because I would not have paid for it, in my opinion. But um, I um, have you seen Concussion though? Concussion? Is it going to give me yeah. a concussion? What? No. When, <laughs> Will Smith's last movie um, that came out on DVD was a movie called Concussion, and it's based okay. on a true story, which mm-hmm. is probably why it was a good movie because it was a true story. Okay. But Will Smith kind of redeemed himself to me in that movie. I was like, okay, this is. This is the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. This is the Will Smith I, I miss, you know, like right. Independent Day, Bad Boys, Men in Black, Will Smith. Right. I mean, not that his performance in Concussion was anything like that, but you know, I just enjoyed his older films so much more than the stuff that he's put out the past couple of years. But I really enjoyed Concussion, so I'm kind of like hoping that that was the start of good Will Smith movies. Um, I mean, I'm just, I'm not trying to uh, bash uh, Will Smith as a bad actor. I just think, I think he's actually a really good actor. I, his kids are not so much. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he's trying to up propel them and get it, uh, pass the torchlight to them. And I don't think that's a good idea at this point. I think they need additional training, in my opinion. But if uh, any Will Smith fans are angry at me now, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I mean, we all know what happens to kids in the spotlight. Like, look at Miley Cyrus, okay? But Miley Cyrus is my girl, though, but she's a little cray-cray. <laughs> um, I think she's... I, I think that's all marketing. I think... I, I don't know. That's, um, a good, that's a good thought, though. You know, that is a really good thought. Um, I'm just trying to think positive. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who knows? She could be cray cray. I, I, who, who knows? Um, she she owns a pig, and uh, um, she I think she turned vegetarian. She owns a pig, and um, she dresses up in really weird costumes like Lady Gaga, and uh, has her ton out too much. I think. <laughs> I, I mean, you would think you have like these uh, uh, assistants backstage, you know, pouring water on her tongue because she has it so out so much but you know that's just gotta keep opinion. her hydrated gotta keep that girl hydrated i know i know she'll be dehydrated well, i actually like, have i actually did hear in an interview with her once i can't recall who the interview was, or like you know what magazine or website or what it was made by but i did see a quote from her once saying that you know the person that she is on stage is very different than the person that she is in real life in real like life, you know yeah. singing is kind of like acting as you put on a performance and so right. I think there's hope that Miley Cyrus is a little normal somewhere under all that oh, me makeup too. and such me too um I am really also really excited because you know it's girl power um next year Wonder Woman Wonder Woman yeah, exactly um I remember when I was a kid I saw the Linda Carter uh, TV series um, the first season it was on ABC and then they moved to CBS with a different costume. Um, but Linda Carter was like the quintessential Wonder Woman. And when Gal Gadot took over the reins, people were so pissed. People were mad. First of all, rude that but people I were know. pissed. Not okay. Second no. of all, mm-hmm. um, Gal is gorgeous and she is built like an Amazon. And apparently she's the first non-Caucasian female to portray Wonder Woman like in movie or TV series, right? Which I think is awesome. Um, yeah. I don't recall her genetic background at this point in time, but I. Um, she's she, from Israel. Right, right, right. right. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, I knew that she was going to have um, a cameo in Batman versus Superman, but I feel like she actually had a very decently sized role in Batman versus Superman and I right. think that yeah and I think that she kind of proved herself in that movie you know she right. the small amount of screen time that she had she kind of showed up she's like you boys are messing around this needs to get done I'm gonna get this done exactly like, so I thought that was awesome so and that wasn't even a movie about her so I'm totally excited for her own standalone movie yeah and she kicks booty I yes, mean she does yes and, like she shows up and the guys are kind of like Wait, what? Like, like, uh, is she with you? I thought she was with right. you. It's like uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> exactly, and um, um, just her, um, 
just also a brief background uh, with the Wonder Woman. Um, she used to, uh, she's an Amazon princess, but she uh, also has a new origin in the New 52. Um, she is now a demigod. She is the daughter of Zeus and Hippolyta. She used to be born of clay and be like a living dreidel, but now she's a, a god, pretty much. That sounds legit. I think that was legit, too. Um, and with the, uh, the reboot birth ser- series, uh, I, I saw some um, previews of what she's going to look like. It's, uh, it's pretty much in line with uh, what uh, Gal Gadot looks like in the films, which I'm like, yes, this, this right. looks so cool. Yeah, I really like that, um, you know, Wonder Woman, you know, is this Amazon, and, you know, she's not a skinny little stick-pole-figured woman, which, you know, people that look like that are great, but I like that she's curvy, and she's big, and she's tall, and she's, you know, because like I said before, like, I like to see all different types of people and situations and and such portrayed in media, you know, and Mm -hmm. I like that, you know, hopefully with, even Batman versus Superman, but especially when the new Wonder Woman movie comes out, you know, that maybe if there are, you know, some preteen girls that are starting to get really tall, you know, see that and they're like, hey, you know what, if Wonder Woman can be tall and kick butt, I can be tall and kick butt, you know? Exactly. And, um, Oh, I was uh, thinking about uh, something else. Um, uh, I really uh, digged her, uh, you know, her w- new weapons that she has. Um, she's uh, got the Court of Alexander. Um, if you remember, like in the middle of the film, um, a Wonder Woman as Diana Prince was in the uh, museum and they were showing her like a, the Sword of Alexander. And uh, Batman or Bruce Wayne came up to Wonder Woman and said, you know, you know this is not the, the real sword. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know, because she had it. <laughs> <laughs> Duh, she had it. And she was kicking butt with it. I mean, that sword can cut yeah. through Kryptonian skin. You know, it can uh, it can kick uh, Superman's butt. Um, and uh, the whole entire criticism that she didn't get enough screen time. Well, if she had more screen time, if, even in the beginning, it the film would have been movie. ten minutes. Right. Yeah. I I really like how Batman vs Superman kind of introduce all the other characters of Justice League. Right. Like, I I specifically like that Wonder Woman got such a, you know, a bigger part than just a, a screenshot cameo, but, um, you know, the other couple of members of Justice League, they were, like, playing, like, the footage tapes or whatever, and they were like, oh, we got to go find these, these people with these powers or whatever, and, you know, they did a flash of the Flash, and they had a flash of Aquaman, mm-hmm. and they had a flash of, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Cyborg. Cyborg, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was like, his name's not Robocop. That's not the right comic book. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, we're starting to run out of time. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk about uh, before we end the show? Um, quick shot. What did you think of Ben Affleck as Bruce Wayne? He, um, he actually did a really good job. I was right. very surprised. I was pleasantly surprised. I rewatched. Um, Ben Affleck's Daredevil a couple months ago and kind of fell asleep a couple times just because it was mm, really slow and it was and kind of you know but I was like I was like okay Bruce or er, Bruce Wayne I was like okay Ben Affleck I'm gonna give you a shot don't you mess up Batman and I thought he did really good I thought he, he did, did really good, good. But, he, uh, I mean you know Ryan Reynolds kind of proved that you can do one bad superhero movie and come back with a great superhero movie so exactly exactly hopefully and, this is a trend that we're gonna start right <laughs> um he uh, kind of played it as a, like a this snooty elitist. Oh, I'm gonna uh, uh, beat people up just just for the right, hell of it. Right. And uh, a lot of people were upset that he, it that didn't uh, show any of the uh, the reasons why he was such a uh, maniacal person. But there were yeah. reference like Easter eggs throughout the movie that gave him that they gave them that gave people the clues that they needed um you got jason right, tide's right. costume I feel like if it was a batman solo film we would have had those answers but it wasn't so we didn't mm. you know well in the uh in july they're supposed to have a blu-ray release so uh it's supposed to have like a three-hour extended cut that's supposed to fix most of the 
you know the the missing pieces. Oh, that would be awesome. Oh, and Batgirl is supposed to be in it too. Are you serious? Yes. Oh, I wish we had three hour extended cuts of every movie ever. I know it would be like Lord of the Rings. That would be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. There was, uh, uh, when they uh, first introduced the film to the uh, executives at Warner Brothers, um, Snyder had a four hour cut of the film. Nice. And in my opinion, I thought, you know, why, you shouldn't have uh, cut it down to two and a half hours. It should have been split into two parts the first part in March and the end part uh, during, you know, like July. Or August. Yeah, that would have been, been really cool. Then they could have, you know, kept all of it. And so many of these movies are doing, you know, part one, part two now anyway. So. Yeah, exactly. So why not follow with the waves, I guess? I why know. didn't you text Zack Snyder? That's on you. Why didn't you do that? <laughs> I should have done it. Um, but I know I, you have his number in your phone. I Do I have it? I don't think I have his red phone with me. Oh, darn it. <laughs> oh, no, snap. Okay, well, uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley and Neil, for being on the show. My name is Joe. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun talking with you. Absolutely, and uh, I really I want you back, and I want you. I, to, w- I want to come back. <laughs> uh, and I want to be a stowaway in your car again, uh, uh, just like I have the little a big truck, So the next Comic Con road trip I go on, you can get. We'll clear some space to you for you next to the luggage. I will. I promise I won't be like Chevy Chase, and I won't bonk anybody's nose <laughs> in. Okay. Well, uh, again, my name is Joe. I'm from the Jody White Talks radio program. You can reach me at Jody White Talks on Twitter. You can reach me at YouTube. Uh, at youtube.com forward slash Jody White Talks. You can also uh, go to my Facebook page at Jody White Talks. I am on Riot Radio Rocks. And you can also listen to many of our other programs at riotradiorocks.com. Download the Stream License app, and you can uh, listen to us. Search us for Riot Radio. Um, Next week, I will have Ben Patrick Johnson on the show. And the week after that, I have Cecil Trackenberg from Good Bad Flicks. Thank you all. Have a great night.